fear, more fear, and rioting. That is the summer of 1919 in America, and in fact, the whole world. Bomb plots and riots and anti-communist hysteria all puncture the hopeful optimism that the end of the world war began to generate. This is Between Two Wars Season 2, a chronological summary of the interwar years, where we cover the zeitgeist, the culture, the technology, the art, the sports, and much more in the era when, for better or for worse, humanity ushered in modern times. I'm Indy Nidell. And here are this season's headlines. War continues in Eastern Europe and Russia, and ethnic conflict now comes to Germany's borderlands with the first Silesian uprising. The Soviet Republic in Hungary has collapsed and the country is slipping into war with its neighbors. But peace is now official in Western Europe, and a German constitution is ratified in August, ushering in the new Republic of Weimar Germany. The Third Anglo-Afghan War ends, and Arab nationalists announce Syrian independence in Damascus. And if you flip through the sports section of the Chicago Herald Examiner starting June 17th, you'll be introduced to Barney Google. The comic strip, which originally appeared as Take Barney Google, for instance, still runs in 2020 in over 900 newspapers in 21 countries as Barney Google and Snuffy Smith. Though, except for a few cameo appearances, Barney Google was written out of his own series in 1954. It is the second longest running syndicated newspaper comic, still making new episodes, just behind Gasoline Alley, which premiered last November. We can thank Barney Google's creator, Billy DeBeck, for adding Hotsy Totsy, Horse Feathers, and the Heebie Jeebies to the English language. Another landmark in the history of reading comes this summer in Berlin. Sold openly at newsstands, Die Freundschaft will be one of the biggest selling and most iconic gay magazines in Weimar, Germany. It publishes sincere articles calling for the decriminalization of homosexuality alongside classified ads allowing men to find other men. Comics and magazines do bring people and communities closer together, and so does modern technology. I've already spoken at length in season one about how aviation is making the world appear smaller and smaller, but there is similar progress on the ground. For starters, a whole bunch of new railway stations are opening in Britain, America, Australia, and more. And old ones are also reopening to the public after previously being reserved for military use. America itself takes further steps towards a complete highway system. From July 7th to September 6th, a U.S. Army expedition travels from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, California to assess the possibilities of crossing the country by road, particularly in times of war. This is a monumental and unique undertaking, bringing the two sides of America ever closer together. But it also highlights the poor state of the largely unpaved roads. The convoy encounters 230 breakdowns of various sorts, destroys 88 wooden bridges when crossing them, and goes at an average speed of 9.1 kilometers per hour. That is less than six miles per hour. The lessons of the convoy will play a big part in encouraging future development of an intercontinental highway system. And interestingly enough, a young lieutenant colonel by the name of Dwight Eisenhower comes along for the ride. And way, way in the future, when he is no longer young, or a military man, President Dwight Eisenhower will authorize one of the largest public works projects in American history with the building of the interstate highway system. It appears as even if the stars are getting closer. On July 28th, the International Astronomers Union is founded. This is an association of professional astronomers that among other things, is the authority for assigning names and designations to celestial bodies like planets and stars. Upon its founding, two subsidiaries are also created, the International Time Commission and the International Central Bureau of Astronomical Telegrams. That's a great name, by the way. But though this ever more navigable modern world promises a new future, a battle still rages over who will inherit it. Now, last time, I talked about the mysterious plot where several high-profile American businessmen and politicians were sent letter bombs. Well, on the evening of June 2nd, 
Within just one hour of each other, eight different cities face bombing attacks. The targets are mainly government officials who have advocated or upheld anti-sedition laws and deportations. Still, there are some other pretty random targets. The rectory of a Catholic church in Philadelphia is blown up. None of the original targets are killed, but one innocent bystander is, and so is one of the conspirators. Now, he was attempting to bomb the home of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, but accidentally set off the bomb prematurely, probably tripping on the stairs leading to the house and blowing himself to pieces. A body part even flies across the street and lands on the doorstep of future President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor. At most of the bomb sites, a leaflet is left titled Plain Words, which reads, there will have to be bloodshed. We will not dodge. There will have to be murder. We will kill because it is necessary. There will have to be destruction. We will destroy to rid the world of your tyrannical institutions. This pamphlet and the remains of the bomber revealing him to be an Italian immigrant will enable the Bureau of Investigation to eventually trace the plots to Gallianists, followers of revolutionary anarchist Luigi Galliani. Galliani, who is so radical that he believes revolutionary unions like the IWW are reformist, is one of the most vocal proponents of the propaganda of the deed. The idea that acts of terror against the ruling class will create such an impression on the masses as to create the conditions for revolution. Over the next few months and years, Many Gallianists will be arrested and or deported in raids by the US government. Funnily enough, Galliani himself is deported back to Italy just a few weeks after the June bombings, but not actually for any connection with them. It's because his newspaper advocated draft dodging during the war and published bomb-making instructions. But as one left-wing threat lessens, a new one emerges. Two new communist parties are created on August 30th and September 1st after a three-way split in the Socialist Party of America. That party has been pulling itself apart over whether to support the common turn, with left-wing elements obviously wanting to, and the traditional leadership not being so keen. So the left-wing ends up splitting from the party, but this left-wing itself is also divided between Americans born in the States and language federations mainly made up of relatively recent immigrants. So the native-borns formed the Communist Labor Party of America on August 30th, and the language federations formed the American Communist Party two days later, September 1st. They will, though, merge in May 1921. The split leaves the original Socialist Party with a membership of 30,000, down from 108,000. Now, the combined membership of these parties is less than one-tenth of one percent of the American adult population they do admittedly have a bigger reach than that. And there is a pretty vibrant market for radical literature. Justice Department records show that there are nearly 500 individual newspapers or periodicals nationwide which advocate violent revolution. Although some of these only come out once or twice a year. Still, in normal circumstances, such a small political force might not cause that much alarm. These are not normal circumstances. The Soviet revolutions abroad and spectacular events such as the Seattle General Strike and the Galeanus bomb plots at home have brought the issue of radicalism to the forefront of the nation's mind. The sense of crisis is no doubt heightened by the racial violence spreading now throughout America. The Chicago race riot explodes this summer on July 27th and lasts into the beginning of August. 38 people, 23 black and 15 white, die, and over 500 are injured. It is the worst race riot in Chicago's history. How does it begin? Well, this decade has seen a huge migration of African Americans from south to north, known as the Great Migration. From 1916 to 1919, the African American population of Chicago increased from 44,000 to 109,000. And ethnic tensions run high, particularly on the south side where housing and work are scarce. Officially, the riot begins after a group of black teenagers drifts into a white swimming area at an unofficially segregated beach. One white man is so indignant at this that he begins throwing rocks at the teenagers, hitting one young boy, Eugene Williams, on the head and causing him to drown. 
In the aftermath, not only does a white police officer prevent his black colleague from arresting the killer, but arrests another black man instead. Anger over the injustice in the black communities and anger at this anger in sections of the white communities means that rioting soon spreads throughout the city. It lasts for five days and is primarily white gangs attacking blacks in black neighborhoods. In one grim instance, a Chicago streetcar is forced to a stop by a gang of white youths. The white driver and passengers are allowed to leave safely, but John Mills and a group of other blacks are dragged from it and brutally beaten. A huge crowd gathers to watch and cheer. Mills manages to escape, but is chased down and is beaten to death. Black gangs also take part in violence, though, including murdering white bystanders like Casmero Lazzaroni, a 60-year-old street peddler who is stabbed to death by a group of young black men. The rioting ends days later after 6,000 National Guardsmen are stationed around the city's Black Belt to protect the area's mostly black residents from further violence. Around 1,000 people are left homeless by arson as well, since white rioters have pulled cables across the streets to prevent the fire department from coming through. This summer sees dozens of similar riots across the country in Washington, D.C., Omaha, Nebraska, Knoxville, Tennessee, and many more places. They may be started by impromptu lynch mobs, but they have a deeper cause as well. Just like in Chicago, many whites are angry at the demographic shift brought on by the Great Migration. Jobs and housing are scarce, and African Americans, they're an easy target for blame. When non-union blacks or Hispanics are used as strike breakers, they're attacked as scabs. At the same time, though, there are reports in the press that blacks and Bolsheviks are secretly colluding to bring down America. The period will become known as the Red Summer, referring to the blood, not communism. With all the riots and bombings and strikes going on, the US government demands that Attorney General Palmer find and destroy the source of all this radical violence. It's also now personal for Palmer after the attempt on his life in the bombings and in August. He organizes the General Intelligence Division within the Department of Justice and recruits a young law school graduate named J. Edgar Hoover to run it. But a man who occasionally uses violence to fight against oppression, against empire even, makes his debut this summer. In fiction, that is. Zorro is created by pulp writer Johnston McCulley, making his first appearance in All Story Weekly in August. Zorro is the heroic identity of Don Diego de la Vega, a California nobleman living in Los Angeles when it was still under Mexican rule. The dashing masked outlaw dresses in black, defends the common people against the tyranny of their oppressors, humiliating the bumbling authorities being himself far too clever and too cunning to ever be caught. Over the years, he will feature in dozens of books, movies, and TV shows. The first film version, The Mark of Zorro, will appear next year, 1920, starring Douglas Fairbanks and released by United Artists. Speaking of films, The Miracle Man, which will be the top grossing film of the year, is released August 29th. It stars Lon Chaney and establishes him as a character actor. It's the story of a group of con men who plan to use a faith healer to swindle a New England town of its money. Also released this summer is German film Madame du Barry, starring Paula Negri. That film has the alternative title Passion in the States. It features Negri as the title character, the last mistress of French King Louis XV, and a victim of the reign of terror during the French Revolution. Fears of a revolutionary mob seem to be the zeitgeist of this season. Or maybe just fear of anything different. Fear of communists, fear of capitalists, fear of this race, fear of that religion, fear of your neighbor, all over the world. And fear leads to hate. Hate leads to violence. And so we see race riots and pogroms. We see violent demonstrations and strikes and equally violent actions against them. We see anti-Bolshevik hysteria at the same time as we see anti-capitalist communist parties springing up like wildfire. With the world war over, this was supposed to be a world of optimism and hope, but we're nowhere near there yet. This is still a world of fear and hatred. If you would like to learn more about the growing pains of the new German Republic, then you can watch our season one video on that right here. 
anytime now. Our Time Ghost Army Member of the Week is Zohar Kapustin. That's kind of like Zorro, yeah? Okay. Well, the Army, the Time Ghost Army, is what funds all of our programming. So join the Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com to get ever more awesome historical content. And, as Don Diego de la Vega once said, when the world shoves you around, you just gotta stand up and shove back. It's not like somebody's gonna save you if you start babbling excuses.